Good morning world, <laughs> welcome to a day in the life of John McGowan. I'm speaking from my bed here in the Carmelite Priory in Kensington, London, England. And I always begin the day with a sign of the cross and a prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I look to the cross on the wall opposite me and I say a prayer. I usually say, speak Lord, your servant is listening. Quoting from uh, the Old Testament, Prophet Samuel. And then beside the cross there is a statue of the, what we call the infant of Prague. And I ask the infant of Prague to send us more vocations. Uh, I'll speak about that later. Now I suppose a Carmelite friar sounds rather a strange way of uh, life for, for many people but actually in many ways it is very similar to most people's lives uh, especially at the beginning of the day because I do everything that everybody else will do at the beginning of the day. Go to the toilet, have a shower, I do some exercises, I shave and then I get dressed. Then I go to prayer. So I, I, I hope you'll enjoy this day uh, and come with me and uh, I'll show you and share with you something about my life on this the 25th of July. Uh, 2020, which incidentally is the day before my 70th birthday. So my day begins, like most people, uh, with a visit to the loo, uh, I, w I don't think I'll film this. Then I have a quick shower. Uh, back in my room I do some exercises.
So you just saw me, you just saw me put on my habit in three pieces. I remember the very first time I put on my habit, I was 24 at the time, and I was so excited, so uplifted. I just couldn't wait to start uh, this new life uh, for me, which I'll explain more about what it is um, later on. Uh, but now I'm dressed and ready, shaved, exercised. Now I'm ready for prayer. So we just go downstairs. It's three flights down to the chapel or sometimes called the oratory. So we're now in our oratory prayer room. One thing I hope you have noticed is how quiet the place is and this is as it should be. It should be quiet. It's a place of prayer and uh, recollection. So we come here every morning uh, and in fact we come here five times a day uh, to, to pray, pray the Psalms, scripture reading, uh, we sing, sing uh, some hymns too, so it's, it's a good place to be.
plants of the earth will bless the Lord. You fountains and springs will bless the Lord. And you the highest glory and praise forever. And, and you rivers and seas will bless the Lord. And you creatures of the sea will bless the Lord. And you every bird in the sky will bless the Lord. And you wild beasts and tame will bless the Lord. To the him be highest glory and praise forever. And you children of men will bless the Lord. To him be highest glory and praise forever. O Israel, bless the Lord, and bless the Lord. And you priests of the Lord, and bless the Lord. And you servants of the Lord, and bless the Lord. To him be highest glory and praise forever. And you spirits and souls of Oh, bless the Lord, and you holy and humble of heart, oh, bless the Lord, and the nice as arrives who is yet to bless the Lord, and who be highest glory and praise forever. Let Let us pray to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to you be highest glory and praise forever. May you be blessed, O Lord, in the heavens, to you be highest glory and praise forever. At once he is the and the Father, and he followed him. We will drink from the chalice that I shall drink, and you will be baptized as I shall be baptized. Sing a new song to the Lord. His praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let and his prayer rejoice in his maker. Let Zion sons exalt in their king. Let, Let them praise his name with dancing. And make music with timbrel and harp. All of our deeds delight in his feet. He crowns the poor with salvation. Let the faithful rejoice in the glory. Shout for joy for the feet and take the rest. Let the praise of God be on their lips and his word so to the land. To be love vengeance to the nations, and the punishment of all the peoples, to bind their kings in chains, and their lovers in fetters of time, glory to carry out the sentence preordained. This honor is for all its faithful. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. You will drink from the chalice that I shall drink, and you will be baptized as I shall be baptized. You are no longer aliens in the foreign land, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of God's household. You are built upon the foundations laid by the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself is the foundation stone. In him the whole building is bound together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you too are being built with all the rest into a spiritual dwelling for God. You will make them rulers over all the land. You will make them rulers over all the land. Your name will all be very remembered. You will you make them, them rulers over all the land. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. You will you make them rulers over all the land. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and his brother James, and led them up a the high mountain. There they were. Blessed be the Lord of God of Israel. He has visited his people and redeemed them. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior in the house of David his servant, as he promised by the lips of holy men, those who were his prophets from old, a Savior who would free us from our foes, from the hands 
So as you can see, we're not many uh, here. We're just three this morning. Uh, normally we would be four. Uh, one of the uh, friars has gone to celebrate Mass uh, in a nearby convent. Uh, Father Theophilus, who was beside me, is wearing his clericals. Normally he'd be wearing his habit like me because quite soon, at half past nine, he has to also go and celebrate Mass in another convent. So we're just four, four different nationalities. Father Christopher, who is the prior, known as the prior, in lay terms he would be the boss. Uh, he's from Ireland. Uh, Father Theophilus uh, is from Nigeria. He's here um, to, uh, by 
uh, how would you say, it's not a mistake, but he came here six months ago from Nigeria for his mother's 80th birthday and then he had a heart attack while he was with her. Uh, he's only in his 40s and uh, was rushed to hospital and so he's now recuperating with us, which is wonderful for us. And then there's uh, the friar you didn't see, Father Tijo. Tijo is from India and he's uh, studying. He's in his 30s. He's now studying a um, two or three year course here in one of the London universities. So after this prayer, uh, we would spend 45 minutes to an hour uh, meditating. We just sit here, we close our eyes and we meditate. Uh, sometimes people ask me, well, what do you think about uh, when you meditate? Well, the idea is to still yourself, to be still, to quieten your mind, um, because God speaks to us uh, in the stillness. Uh, when I say speaks to us, uh, it's not that I ever hear him speaking to me, but um, we, we, that's the idea, is to be still. And uh, God then works in us. It's a slow process. <laughs> it is a slow process. But when I look back over the years, uh, I see the progress I've made. I can't see the immediate progress from one day to the next, or one week to the next, or even year to the next. But over the years, you know, I, I have deepened in my faith. I, I, I'm much more focused on Christ now than I was in my 20s and 30s. Uh, so, so, yes, uh, prayer does work, um, but it's invisible, you can't measure it. But, but I, I sense it now, I sense that I am uh, just that much more serious about my faith uh, and about God and about my role in life. So, that's what we would do now for 45 to 60 minutes, we would just quieten our minds. Of course, sometimes when you do that, when you close your eyes and you meditate, your mind goes off in all sorts of directions. There are so many uh, things that come into your mind and um, not all of them holy. So you can spend quite a lot of time trying to refocus, trying to put aside these distractions and think about God and his presence to you and, and his loving presence because he's not just there looking at you, but he's there as a loving presence. So I just am with him in the knowledge that he is with me and that he loves me in spite of all my faults and all my many failings. So now, uh, uh, rather than have this period of meditation, um, we'll go uh, and have breakfast. Right now, I'm starving. I joined the Carmelite Order when I was 25. I've mentioned the Carmelites a few times now, just to explain who they are. The Carmelites were founded originally in the 12th century um, in a place near Haifa, Mount Carmel. Anybody who's been to the Holy Land will probably have been to Mount Carmel. That's where we first began during the time of the Crusades. That's probably why we went there. But then we were forced back into Europe and established communities in Europe. Um, the Carmelites to, in the 16th century were reformed um, by that lady, that Teresa of Avila. She reformed them in Spain in the 16th century. 
So now there's two branches of the same order, and I belong to the uh, the reform branch known as discalc carmelites, which is I know a peculiar word, and people often ask, what on earth does discalc mean? Well, it means without shoes. That's what it means. It's kind of synonymous for reform. So. So that's now we, we've grown uh, as an order, um, and uh, we are four thousand friars throughout the world, and eleven thousand nuns. Uh, our nuns, uh, dear nuns, are in, in clothes. Uh, and um, though in England and in Western Europe, our numbers are dropping, and they're dropping quite rapidly. As you can see, I'm the only one uh, here in the dining room this morning. Usually there would be a few others, but for one reason or another, they've chosen you know, not to come to have breakfast. I love uh, having breakfast with, with other people just to have a chat. So uh, th that, that's something about the calm light order. I don't know if that's very helpful. We're friars rather than monks. A friar is, comes from the French word frere, meaning uh, brother, uh, monk comes from the Latin word monos, uh, meaning alone. So we live in small communities and we move from place to place, whereas a monk uh, lives in a, a monastery and uh, he is stable uh, in that monastery. Um, what, what I find most challenging about uh, living uh, as a calm light would be community life. Um, we, we're all different, we come from different backgrounds in this house with even different nationalities, so different cultures, our mother languages are different. So inevitably there will be difficulties, there will be tensions at times, but that's inevitable. But also what I enjoy most about uh, living a religious life has come, is community life. And it's not a contradiction. Um, it's, it's, um, it's the way it is. There's pluses and minuses. But the pluses far outweigh the minuses. I, 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 I love community. I like being with others. Um, it, it, it's a special way of life. But, but not that different. And I hope through this uh, video to show it, it, our way of life it isn't that different. I, I, obviously in some ways it is, but essentially it's about how do you live with other people? And whether you're married, you're single, working, uh, that's, that's what it's about. You're a filmmaker, it's how do you live and deal with other people? So. So in that sense, we're, we're not very different at all. I hope that helps explain us a little bit better, but I shall continue the explanation as we go throughout the day. Let me take you on a tour of our lovely garden. There's some chairs here, these are uh, here, we were going to have mass outside uh, because um, we're limited to the number of people we can have in our church because of the coronavirus, so we were planning um, if we got too many that we would have the mass outside, but it, obviously uh, 
the chairs haven't been put back. In fact, we didn't get that many, so we didn't have mass outside. We'll look at the apples beginning to fall off the tree. They look very nice. Here's where the temporary altar was, should we have had mass outside, but as I said, we didn't need to do that. So. We are so lucky to have this garden here in the middle of Kensington. <laughs> Must be worth a, a fortune. There we are. Now we have this table set up here and occasionally when the weather's nice uh, it isn't today we would uh, have a meal outside it's rather nice hmm. <coughs> there's our old, there's our priory built in 1862 So we've been here over 150 years. And it's just beginning to rain. Not to worry, look at those lovely roses. now of our place. There's a statue of Teresa of Avila. She looked very white there. Seen a ghost. Ha ha ha. I, I joined the order when I was 25, which in those days, and that's uh, 1975, which in those days would have been considered what they call a late vocation. So I didn't always want to be a priest by any means. Um, I'd never thought about priesthood when I was at school, even though I came from a good uh, Irish Catholic family, uh, born in South London, not that far from here actually. Um, but yes, growing up in my teens, uh, never thought at all about priesthood. Um, uh, in fact, in my teens, I drifted away from the church uh, till I was at, what, 23, 24. Uh, I was brought up in the 60s, and though I was by no means radical, nonetheless, I was influenced by this uh, world around me. Uh, it was the, the birth, really, wasn't it, of a, of a pop culture. And that wasn't, it wasn't cool to go to church. So gradually uh, I stopped going to church. Uh, from, from the age of 15, uh, three months, I remember, I think I was 15 years, three months, and I started looking for a job uh, on Saturdays. Maybe I was influenced by my sister who ha was working on Saturdays, but that's, I started and, and I spent, what, years afterwards working on Saturdays and then during the school holidays. I, I first began in a shop called David Gregg's, which I think has long since gone. Uh, it was a grocer's in Tooting, a uh, place called Tooting Junction. And that's where I learned about people and I really like serving people. So, so... So later on, when I was thinking about what to do with my life, one of the things I said is, whatever it is, I want it to be with people, serving people. 
so I left school at 18. I had one A level in art, that's all, not much. And I went to begin work in London in the shipping and forwarding office. And I spent, what, from 68 till 74 doing that. Um, after a while I got bored with one company and I changed to another. I even managed to get to Paris for a year uh, doing the same work. But I wasn't so interested in the work as living in Paris. The experience, you imagine a 20, 21 year old living in Paris. And uh, I grew up a lot in Paris. Uh, it was um, a good experience for me, even though it wasn't by any means uh, always pleasant. But, but um, I learned a lot about life and I learned a lot about myself. So then I came back from Paris and I continued working shipping and forwarding until one day I said, enough, enough, I, I, I've had enough of this. And, but the trouble is I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it's all very well being fed up with something, but then you have to, what, what do you do? And I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I probably spent a couple of years, 18 months, two years, thinking what am I going to do with my life? By this stage I come back to church and I really had came back, I came back with a vengeance. I, I, I went to church a lot and I prayed a lot. And I suppose it was no surprise one day when a priest asked me, uh, John, do you ever think about being a priest? And of course uh, I hadn't. I mean, to me, the idea of a priest was um, not quite unimaginable but just extraordinary an extraordinary kind of life but I felt very ordinary so I just couldn't see myself as a priest but what he did is he put a seed into my head and sometime afterwards and not that long maybe a month or two I was walking down the road where I lived with my family my parents and it dawned on me one day, look, you're looking to work with people, to serve people. You can do that as a priest. And that was it. Uh, by the time I got to the top of the road, which was only about a hundred yards away, I knew I wanted to be a priest and uh, my life had changed. Yes, that, it, was, it was that quick, that sudden. But then I've been waiting uh, two years uh, for this. So that's what happened. I, I went to see this priest. He sent me to see a, what they call a vocations director. And, uh, and then um, he recommended I go to the Carmelites. So I came to the Carmelites. It was all very strange, but, but I liked what I saw. And I felt this is what God was calling to me. And so that's how I ended up uh, becoming a Carmelite. <laughs> and as they say, the rest is history. That was what, uh, 19, actually when I was thinking about it, it was 1974. And then I came here to this church in Kensington to inquire in 1974. So you know, that's in other words, that's uh, well over 40 years uh, ago. So now I'll take you up another way there is the second staircase we have towards the other end of our building Lots of grandfather clocks in this house. Ooh, that's the front doorbell. What a magnificent painting.
you wouldn't lose your faith here. So, back to my room. That uh, ring at the doorbell turned out to be <coughs> a delivery for me for tomorrow. Look at that. Somebody's brought me some beautiful flowers, aren't they beautiful? And then this bottle <laughs> of champagne. Look at that. Gosset Champagne Grand Reserve. Wow. So, uh, uh, this is nice. Uh, this is beautiful. I'm not going to look at the card yet from, from this person. I'm going to look at it tomorrow. I'm kind of sentimental like that. Um, I, I have a few birthday cards already. I'll show you them in here. But I don't want to open them yet. Uh, so uh, now it's time for work. I have to clean my room. I have uh, to clean the corridor, this top floor corridor. Uh, I have to do my washing, I have to do my ironing, <laughs> so it's quite a busy day, uh, Saturday, uh, but it's good to work with your hands.
I'm going to take you now uh, into our church. Just walking down the corridor, nice and bright, beside the church. Uh, you'll see it's a lot gloomier when we go into the church. Now uh, we're in the church, as you can see, I have my uh, Roman collar on. Um, I wear this when I'm not wearing my habit. Um, if you wear a Roman collar, you are definitely a, a sign of contradiction in today's church. Or it, rather, not so much in the church, hopefully, <laughs> but maybe there as well. But certainly in uh, today's world, uh, which is really, especially in, in England, quite secular, materialistic so you, you are different and I'm somebody who doesn't like to be different so I, I find it a bit of a challenge but it's a challenge I'm up to I think I'm quite happy to be different at times even though as I mentioned before I'm a bit of a conformist so this is our church it was built by Gilbert Scott in the uh, 1960s uh, there was an older church here, but it was bombed during the war uh, and sadly uh, burnt down. So Gilbert Scott is a famous architect. The Gilbert Scott are a dynasty. They um, have uh, famous for other buildings, including uh, the um, Albert Memorial, the Liverpool Anglican Cathedral, uh, the Battersea Power Station, uh, even the red telephone box is designed by Gilbert Scott, so we're very proud to have him uh, as the architect of our church. Well, we, we don't get too many people coming here, um, now that is, because of the COVID-19. Uh, we're limited to the numbers we can take anyway, and we, we have uh, restrictions on the people that can come into the church. Uh, but fortunately we haven't actually reached those numbers yet. Uh, we have what, five masses on a Sunday, which is a lot. Uh, one on Saturday and, and four on Sunday. So about 200 people uh, came to the church last Sunday. Um, I'll take you round to the confessional because for me it's one of the most uh, significant places in the church. So here's one of our confessionals. You can see that's where the priest sits. You can see the, the stole, the purple stole that he usually wears. And this is, on this side is where the people go if they want to confess their sins. I can't open it now. Let's see if I can open the other door. No, I can't open it either. But anyway, they go in and they kneel down. And uh, that where they would confess sins. And I have to say that I never feel more like a priest than when I'm hearing confessions. I can honestly say that you see the best of people uh, in the confessional. It's quite wonderful. And what's also wonderful is the trust that people have in you. You know, in spite of all the abuse that we hear about uh, uh, um, amongst the clergy, in spite of that, people trust us. I mean, they, they say things to us that they have never told anybody else. What a privilege that is. I mean, it is such a privilege. So I love uh, 
and the confessional and the healing that goes on here. I mean, just by listening to people, you are healing them. Sometimes you don't have to say anything. You just listen to them and, and, and you're doing so much good. So it's a beautiful sacrament. I, I love it and uh, thank God. Yeah, sometimes when I hear the confession of somebody who, who has really been tormented by something, I, I thank God for being a priest. I think it's worth it just to hear this person alive. Wonderful. So it's, we, we had six confessions, six confessionals. We, we only really use one or two now because for one reason or another, there are fewer people coming to church and fewer people coming to confession. So, um, so it's my job now to stay here at the back of the church from half past 11 till one o'clock uh, to meet people as they come in to um, get their names and addresses. We have some helpers with us, thank God, uh, because uh, we need to track and trace. The government has asked us to do that. So normally you can just go into church, but now we have to ask for a name and address and then we give people a number so the next time they come in they just tell us their number so that's my job my task for the next uh, hour and a half The Gospel of the Lord. I'm wearing red vestments because, as you probably know, red signifies martyrdom, and today we are celebrating the feast of St. James, who was a disciple of Christ, one of the twelve apostles, and was the very first to give his life uh, for Christ. And the word martyr is a Greek word that means witness. So he witnessed to I just like to make two points, two other points, and the first is that often when people hear about martyrs and people who died for their faith, they say, I couldn't do that, I could never do that. And the truth is, you, you don't know, um, you really don't know, because it isn't you. It is the grace of God working in you. That's what St. Paul says at the end of this letter. You see, all this is for your benefit. That the more grace multiplied among people, the more thanksgiving there will be to the glory of God. So anything that I do in any way of suffering, and say ultimately of giving one's life, it's coming from God. God gives you the strength to do the things that you 
say, I could never do. So it's what we call grace, this mysterious but reality we call grace. God gives you the grace to do something that you say, now, I could never do that. I could never be like St. James. And the other thing I want to point out to you is the last theme of the gospel where Jesus himself says, I haven't come to be to serve, but to be served, but to serve, and to give uh, my life as a ransom for many. So us too. We, we, Jesus is our model. And so we are here to serve other people in a multitude of ways. And service is, is, is something you get inside your head that, that I want to help other people. I want to serve other people in some way or other. I want to serve. And, and Jesus is our model. So if you're aristocracy, if you're the poorest of the poor, and everything else in between, you, we are called to serve other people in imitation of Christ, who is our supreme master and Lord, and yet he himself washed his disciples' feet to give us an example. So you don't have to wash people's feet, but there are many, many other ways of being of service to others. And, and, and if you do that, you overcome arrogance, overcome pride and those are two sins that we have to constantly fight against arrogance and pride so it's not easy sometimes of course it's easy sometimes it's easy to serve you're willing but you know somebody's not grateful for the help you're giving them sometimes people don't say thank you now are you still willing to serve that that can be the acid test Since I have chosen your precepts, 
The Lord gives the light in his people. He guards the Lord with salvation. Let us pray. 
Lord God, you have sent her to sacrifice for St. James, the first of your apostles, to give his life for your sake. May your church find strength in this martyr and support in his constant prayer. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. A day in the life, yeah, the essence of it is vocation, yeah. Mm. Mm. You must shoot the master. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did, yeah, yeah. Not all of it, but um, yeah, just some of it, yeah. Mm. You know, and, and, and it looked funny on film giving out communion with a mask on. But there we are, that's what we have to do these days, isn't it? Mm. Mm? I printed a thing about masks. Yeah, I saw that, yes, it's a good idea, isn't it? Yeah, that you could both wear masks, it reduces the... 1.5. One point five. Yeah. Yeah. So I can understand if you're wearing how you have to have some masks. We haven't had guidelines yet, have we, about wearing them in the church? You know, oh, yeah. well, not not um, not not like they have in shops. You're obliged to wear. Hmm? Yeah, is that right? So there is actually. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we're, that's right, yes. So maybe that's why we haven't had those strict guidelines yet. But it, it could come. Well, most of them are very masks. Yeah, a good number are wearing masks, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. There was a good, good crowd at church, wasn't there? About, there were about 40 at Mass. I'm back in my room now. Uh, lunch is half an hour late, um, so that's all right. Um, so after mass, we went into the the chapel or the oratory, and we said what we call midday prayer. And normally we go from midday prayer then to have lunch, but th there's been a delay. Um, so I, I, uh, they give me a chance to catch up on things I wasn't able to do this morning. So one of the things I like to do every morning is to write my diary and uh, that will give me the chance because I had to do all the cleaning. I didn't get the chance to write my diary but I, I, I can do that now. I've also written a letter to the ambassador of the Nicaraguan embassy and I'll explain why I've done that uh, later. But I'll be going to the embassy with the letter to, to deliver it by hand because it's opposite our church. Okay.
So talking about my diary, I'd like to just show you my diaries. I've been keeping them since uh, 1983, the first one, that blue one there, uh, it's written 1983, uh, and it was when I went to Rome. Uh, I went there for two years to do further studies after my ordination, and uh, I didn't find study uh, easy. I know some people find it easier. I'm sure, nobody finds it that easy, but yeah, I I I, I tried though. That's that was uh, one thing I could say that I tried. So that was two years, then I came back to England. And then um, in uh, uh, the year 1998, I was asked, kind of out of the blue, to go to Jerusalem. So I spent the next four and a half years, from 98 to 2003, in Jerusalem. Now that was an experience. See that 2003... One. Uh, it, it's actually in Arabic to the lettering 2003 yeah now that was um, a life changing experience to be in Jerusalem first of all because you were there in the land where Christ uh, lived, walked, breathed climbed up hills and of course where he died and rose again also politically, it's the birth of a new nation. Israel is still very new, and you can tell. Um, the intifada occurred, the second intifada occurred, when I was there in 2003, and uh, that was a bit scary. Uh, but uh, anyway, I survived uh, that. And then in 2000. Uh, and uh, three, I left Jerusalem, and uh, to my surprise again, I was asked to go back to Rome, where I spent six years. Now this time I was in the, uh, the what we call our head office, Casa Generalizia, and uh, less interesting, I must say, to the experience of Jerusalem, which was absolutely fascinating, and I, I was work orientated in Rome. I was sitting behind a, a desk and a computer and did a lot of translation work when I was there. Uh, I do remember getting on a bus when I first got there and just realizing that there's going to be no bomb on this bus. Um, whereas in Jerusalem, you never knew if there was going to be a bomb on the bus. And I can assure you that made you tense. So when I left Jerusalem, every car door that banged, every bang, I jumped. Um, that, that's what it does to you. Yeah. Then um, in 2011, yeah, I went to, uh, when I finished in, in Rome, I, I spent six months in Malawi. Marvellous experience. Everyone, but everyone, if they can, should go to Africa. Uh, there is so much to learn about life, people in Africa. You know they have very little in Africa, and certainly in Malawi, but you know they're so much happier than we are uh, in Europe. So they're my diaries. Um, I came back to England in 2011 and have been here ever since. Been great. Now, so underneath there's some books on art. I was quite good at art in school. Not brilliant, but quite good, better than average. And so I tried to get back into art in more recent years. And then there are my uh, dictionaries that I needed, a nice Hebrew dictionary there. And then there's this um, uh, Hebrew Bible translated into English, which I try and read. don't read as much as I, I should, but I try and read that. And then uh, other prayer books. Um, and other such things. There's the Pope, John Paul II. He was the one who ordained me uh, back in 1982 in Manchester. Under him is a, these yellow sheets. There's a list of names of political prisoners in Nicaragua um, that I pray for. There's about 800 names on that list. Uh, they're my car keys, and there's my, my golf card. 
I'm, I'm not getting any better. If anything, I think I'm getting worse. See what I got. I got 10 on my first hole. There we are, 10 on the par 5. Uh, and um, th the week before last, I got 14 on the same hole. Uh, my handicap is 26. <laughs> it could actually even be higher. So there's a painting of John Paul II that I painted in 2009. Uh, I was ordained in uh, 1982. Uh, yes, 1982. And uh, I quite like that. I mean, I, I was pleased that I put it into a painting because photographs will fade, but, but a painting hopefully will last longer. And I just felt that was important. There's the man again. Somebody had come like nuns in Notting Hill Carmel did that for me at the time. So there's the cross I look at first thing in the morning. There's the what we call the divine infant of Prague. I asked for vocations. There's uh, Teresa of Avila. She's sort of a cartoon, quite different from the painting we saw downstairs. She's got the staff in her hand because she walked a lot and uh, she travelled the length and breadth of Spain and in her hand is a dove which symbolises the Holy Spirit. So there's my room. Yeah. Oh yeah, above my desk there's um, some pictures and photographs of significant people in my life uh, who have died and I, I like to remember them in that way and uh, I know they're praying for me. Yeah, let's have a look out the window, see what kind of view we've got. It's not brilliant because of those flats opposite. I'm looking down towards High Street Kensington. Yeah, and to the right there's Earl's Court, but you, you can't see anything. Yeah, hammer.
And since, since the 30 years ago, you know, when it was what ministry you like, the Sheet House came down at the bottom. For five years, working. Yeah, which ones they didn't want to work in, yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, we didn't join the orders to do what we like. Well, not quite a problem with people in there. There was a time when we were um, all parishes in England, even in this place, Third Cross, in Canton, and why there's still going to question me. So you No, that was the only one that wasn't. But all the others were parishes. Yeah, like the crown. Mm. Wow. Remember? Thank you, love. The crown. Yeah. When, when King Philip wanted to be the seat. Yeah. <laughs> you wanted to shoot and bump fast, didn't it? Mm. Yeah. 
Well, I'm not 70 till tomorrow. Mm. <coughs> You're not in a rush? No. Well, I'm 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 traveling tomorrow. Yeah, after mm -hmm. the mass. Yeah, yeah. after the mass. There's a, a, a friend of mine who um, was delighted when he found out he was a few days younger than on his birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> the union. How do you know? Yeah. It wants to be in the union. In Ireland or in no. the uh, Oh, Majesty. Oh. That must be. Well, our Majesty the her down our first government. Thomas <coughs> Johnson sold them down a bit. Boris Johnson was yesterday or day before us in Scotland, didn't it? Right. He was. And he was speaking for unity. No, 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 no. Right. Yes, he likes his unity. I mean, of course, we all would, but. Oh, you could almost well, you know, like it was right to move the house of the house of Parliament of Tedmark. How will we go down there? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at the paper this morning. He looks better, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. mm. Looks more alert. He wants everyone out. He's a strong way. Even that uh, opposition leader has lost a little bit of weight. He has shrunk. Uh, Kirsten. Yeah. Weren't yeah. uh, well, they going to have a cabinet reshuffle on Mark? Or was that. Did I miss something? I thought they were going to have. 
Some super candidates, uh, oh. the, uh, the Democrats. I mean, no, they, they really have had some super, like there's somebody called O'Rourke, there was a woman in them. California, there was the woman still in New York. But listen to them, and when you listen to them, and you hear people talking about them, they're superb candidates, they have charisma, but for some reason or other, I don't know what it is about American politics, but they, you have to be at a certain age. You know, you need to be much more than two. Yes. Especially, my dad was a young man. Yeah, he was. Yeah, and Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where are you going? Yeah. She. We do get things so much about for the next instance, as far as that is. Amen. So it's the part of the stuff that's to be. Amen.
that um, iron gate there that used to be closed and written on it is cloister so um, what I suppose about 40 years ago nobody no lay person could come upstairs uh, it was cloister sort of strictly just for us friars now I'm taking you into another room here which is another one of my favorite rooms Love this room. Yeah, it's our TV room. You can see the TV. We come here most evenings to. Uh, I usually just come to watch the news. So on Sunday evening, we will come here and uh, watch a film. Uh, sometimes, uh, but not that often, we'll have a chat. We'll have some drinks. We have the drinks anyway if we're watching the film. Or just chatting and uh, so this is a, a comfortable room lots of books is kind of a library as well yeah show you the view outside the back door oh. mm. Looking into Duke's Lane, it's a miserable day. Although it's not raining yet, but apparently it's going to, and I was going to go out for a walk this afternoon. I, I still will, I'll bring an umbrella though. So that's, this is our, our library. Lots of books on spirituality, Bible studies, theology, spirituality, Church history, yeah, miscellaneous books there. It's a nice painting. The Venetian school, Lorenzo Lotto, question mark, 1480 to 1556. Wow. And uh, all those books there, they're all mostly about Teresa of Avila, our foundress. Uh, so are these and other biographies of our saints. We're blessed as an order to have many saints. If you mention the Carmelites to Catholics, they say, ooh, Carmelites, eh? Ooh. Austere. Yeah, well, we used to be. <laughs> There's a nice photograph of Therese. I'll show you Therese there. Now, Therese of Lisieux, she is considered the most popular saint of uh, recent times. So she only lived till she was, what, 24? Uh, and died in 1897. And yet today, yeah, she's the Pope who canonized her, Pius X, uh, said that she's the most popular saint of modern times. And if you go into any church in England or Ireland uh, and elsewhere in Europe, you'll see, usually you'll see a statue to her the, the other statue is to Antony of Padua. They're the two most popular saints in the church from the point of view of statues and popular devotion. Therese of Lisieux, sometimes called the Little Flower, and uh, Antony of Padua. Yeah, so I just thought you might like to see this room. It's nice and light, isn't it? Lots of light. Yeah. So now I'm going to go back to my room. So uh, one of the traditions we picked up from Spain, our roots going back to Teresa of Avila in Spain, is that after lunch we have a siesta. So that's what I'm going to have now <laughs> for about, what's the time yet? So three o'clock, that's 50 minutes, I'm going to have a siesta. Now, I've been doing this for, for years and uh, it's probably one of the reasons why I'm reasonably sane. <laughs> so, bye now. See you later.
No, take those off. <clears throat> right. I slept. Always do. Usually do, anyway. So now, time for work. Right, well, I'm going to go out now to the Nicaraguan Embassy, which is only about 150 meters uh, from our church. And it's raining. Got my umbrella with me. Not easy to put it up one handed. Yes, it is raining. It was forecast. Now, I um, first uh, became interested in Nicaragua back in the 1980s. Um, I wasn't ever that political, but in the 1980s, um, I took an interest in the situation there with the, Ronald Reagan was president at the time in America and there was the Contras in Nicaragua and uh, a lot of dirty politics going on. Um, more recently, uh, since 2018, the situation has got a lot worse in uh, Nicaragua due to uh, the president, Daniel Ortega, uh, really clamping down on any kind of opposition, any kind of process, uh, protest, peaceful protest. Um, And so since April of 2018, there has been a, a lot of people killed, and um, particularly young people. So many of the names I have in my room are from young people, or of young people. And I have a letter now that I've written to the ambassador to uh, ask her uh, to release uh, some prisoners. I, I have their names. I just crossed the road and I can concentrate. Yeah. There we go. This is the embassy of Nicaragua. It's one of the few embassies I know, and there's lots of embassies around here that um, doesn't have uh, its own flag outside. So he here's the letter. It's the second letter I've written within um, two weeks, and. Um, I also know one of the bishops in Nicaragua. He uh, is a very brave man. And whereas initially the church was used as a go-between, an arbitrator between those who were dissatisfied with the government and the government itself, uh, now the government has turned against the church, accusing it of being communist. And one of the bishops uh, is somebody that I know. Um, he stayed with us in England many years ago. 
and uh, he he has been beaten up. Uh, they slashed his arm and they took his ring in the cathedral, all in front of the papal nuncio and uh, the his own archbishop. So uh, he, he uh, Bayers is his surname, and he's a brave man. So I'm just doing what I can here to help uh, these people who can't help themselves. They're, 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 and yet they're very brave. I admire their courage, the way that they still fly their flag uh, in spite of persecution. So it's not costing me anything, and so uh, that's, that's what I, I, I can do. I've been outside here to demonstrate a couple of times with members from the Nicaraguan sort of uh, parties who oppose the Daniel Ortega government. Anyway, that's that's uh, what what um, I do, and let's see what happens. Let's see if I get a reply this time from Her Excellency. I did last time, and something tells me I, I won't this time. So here we are at uh, Holland Park. Welcome to Holland Park, Duchess of Bedford entrance. Normally there would be hundreds and hundreds of people here, but not today. I haven't quite got the place to myself, but there's not that many people here. It's just a place where people like to come and walk their dogs. mostly dog dog walkers who are out now. This place to my left, this open field, usually there'd be hundreds and hundreds of people uh, here. Um, but look, empty now. There's the old house. The um, construction company Conway is building a pathway here. You can just see the green fencing to the right. Uh, they've been here now for quite some time. I suppose COVID has affected them. So, like, there's nobody working today. Uh, maybe because of the rain. But that's that's just the section now that they built and when it will be finished it's going to look lovely but uh, yeah they've been here yeah I think a couple of months normally they would have done this within a few weeks but there we are Here's a popular place for people to sit down and play chess. But uh, maybe playing chess today. Hmm. Lots of young people are 
just around the corner here. This one is uh, sheltering from the rain. Lovely fountain. Beautiful sound of water. Mm. There'd be a, normally a large chess uh, set here. Uh, the, the piece would be about two foot high, but um, everything's been affected by COVID and 19. That's a nice modern sculpture I like back in there. Now around the corner there's a a man. He's a Is, uh, know what material they've used anyway it's uh, it, it, it's I like it uh, this this man who's walking in his whatever it's not a suit ah uh, Now we come to the Japanese garden, which as I say is one of my favourite places to go. And as I say, you, you will see why. And of course, one advantage now is there won't be too many people here. Normally it is packed. In fact, during the months of, um, well, it was March, wasn't it? March. So in uh, April and May it was closed. Uh, because they were just, it's quite small and there were too many people inside. It's called, more precisely, Coyota Garden. Please respect this area as one set aside for quiet and contemplation. Nice. And this tells us a little bit about its history. 
Japanese-style gardens trace their origin to respect and admiration for natural forms such as trees and rocks. These feelings towards nature, gradually refined by artistic creativity throughout our history, express themselves in the form of the Japanese gardens we now have. Hmm. another plaque with all the people who donated uh, to the garden and it was first constructed as part of the Japanese festival of 1991 We've got these arrows on the path so that we all walk in one direction. waterfall over there. We're going to go over there in a bit. Please walk clockwise around the garden. Okay. Also Says, please do not feed the fish. There's beautiful koi fish in this garden. That's something you don't see very often, there's litter here, but there's just a little bit of litter. I suppose the people who clear it up uh, are not around. Stopping on the bridge. And uh, I don't know if you can see, but people throw money. There's lots of trophy fountains here. There's some tiny koi there. I've just seen ones where it's like a goldfish, but we have heron who come here and they, they eat the fish, which is sad. They don't, when they get to this size, when they get really big though, they, they, they don't trouble them. But they eat up all the smaller fish. Let's just have a 
look at that waterfall again. It's beautiful. This place is good for the mind, the body and even the soul. I mentioned at the beginning of the day, at the very beginning, I prayed that uh, God would send us more vocations. And uh, the reason I make that prayer each morning is because I'm what they call vocations director for my order. And that means that it's my responsibility uh, to try and recruit more people. I've been doing this now for, what, three years and to date without one single <laughs> vocation. Um, it's not for lack of trying. I have uh, done everything that you're supposed to do in order to track vocations. So, for example, I use social media a lot. I use Twitter, I use Instagram, I use Facebook. Um, I've made uh, several videos and um, I've gone on pilgrimages. Uh, I've gone to probably about 15 university chaplaincies and, and spoke there. And uh, all that without uh, any success. It, unfortunately, there is a shortage of vocation, not just in England, but throughout Western Europe, North America. Um, it, it's something that has happened in the last sort of 20, 30 years. So, um, if somebody were to ask me, would you recommend someone to join your order? Um, I would have absolutely no hesitation whatsoever to say yes. If you feel that you are called by God, then yes, because you won't want anything else. Of course, one could ask, well, how do you know if you're called by God to religious life, to priesthood? And the simple answer is, you know. You know it. It's a bit like marriage, uh, that conviction. When you meet someone and you, you realize, I want to spend the rest of my life with this, pe this person, you, you know it. It's not just in your head, but it's also in your heart. It, it's your whole being. And so it's the same for someone who is attracted to our way of life. Remembering that it's a calling from God. And if God calls you, uh, then you won't want anything else. So yes, I would encourage anybody who feels called by God to join uh, our way of life, uh, most, most certainly. And I do that in spite of all the problems that we've had in recent years with abuse. It, it's, you know, actually, uh, I've never suffered uh, personally from people who uh, have uh, been abusive to me because of uh, priesthood. Uh, I, I thank God I haven't suffered. I know some who have, but I personally haven't. But in spite of that, uh, people trust us 
Uh, it's such a great privilege you know, to be a priest. I can't thank God enough for choosing me uh, to be a priest. It's everything uh, I could have wanted. The fulfillment of all the talents that I have, this love I have for people and working with people, the people I meet, uh, it, it, uh, as I said, I'm so grateful to God and I really, really uh, can recommend anyone uh, to this way of life. You won't want anything else. So now what we're going to do, uh, we're going to walk back uh, to um, buy a newspaper and then go into my favourite cafe. So, so, so now I'm back on uh, Church Street and uh, walking up towards the shop where I buy a newspaper. I, uh, I don't normally go to this store. I like to go to a small family-run store that's uh, they're Sri Lankan uh, in order to support them. But I like to buy the Guardian newspaper and they don't have that newspaper. Uh, there anymore and when I inquired they said well you know we uh, we keep, keep getting them left over and so so we tell the supplier not to bring them again right so I have to go here but um, I always buy the Guardian I've tried reading all the other newspapers over the years and uh, I've settled on the Guardian um, which I consider by far the best newspaper. I find it the most balanced and its investigative journalism uh, is unsurpassed by any other uh, British newspaper. So here we are, same breeze. Used to be queues outside here to get in, uh, but not anymore. Look, you see on the ground all the... Now you can just walk in. Sacrificial lambs in COVID childcare crisis. Right. So now I've got my newspaper and I make my way to the Greek cafe. Normally I go in the morning, but uh, today has been a little bit different, busy, so um, I, I like uh, the place, I I'll tell you why in a bit, um, we're just coming to the bend here, um, Church Street, Kensington Church Street is famous for its antique shops, there's not too many at at this end, but they're there. Um, and on the bend is our church. Uh, the street isn't named after Kensington Church Street. It's not named after our church. It's named after the one on the corner, which we will see, uh, called St. Mary Abbott's. Here's our church here. That's the facade, that's the entrance. And here's that uh, crucifix. You know, a good number of people come and they stop and they pray. It's quite edifying to see that. So here we are on the corner of Church Street. We get a lot of people coming here because it's such a good bus service. There's at least five buses 
uh, past on this street alone and then and then in High Street Kensington there's two or three others so that's one reason why we get such a good congregation. In the distance you can just see uh, the big departmental store, what used to be the departmental store, now it's uh, um, it's broken up into lots of different uh, stores. Whole Food, for example, is one of them. Yeah, so I like coming into this cafe because it's not a chain. Uh, I like to support family business. They are Greek and very Greek. Uh, they. Yeah, there's something just natural, normal, down to earth. That they can be, they can be bad tempered. <laughs> yeah, not usually, but they can be. They, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're not uh, always so sweet and smiling. And I don't mind that. I, I, I prefer that to sort of artificial sweetness. So. Okay. Hi, Martina. How are you? Good, all about the seeing you. <laughs> yeah, could I have a, 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 a tea, please? A pot of tea? Yeah. yeah. Hello, nice to see you again. When's Pan back? Any news? At the end of this month. Well, we haven't got much longer, have we? So next week. Yeah. Dear Pan, yeah. Pan uh, is the man who uh, like owns this place and he's been stuck in Greece uh, since the beginning of the lockdown. Lovely. And can I have uh, one of these, please? Yes. Yeah. No, the uh, round one with the current thing, yes. I should know what it's called, but I'm afraid I don't. Lovely. And another thing I like about here is you don't have to pay till you leave, which is you know, what I was used to when I was living in Italy and France. There's something very trusting about that. So I, 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 I love to come in here and uh, read my newspaper, spend maybe 20 minutes, maybe more, uh, reading it. I did that avidly uh, during the Brexit uh, time and, um, and uh, now I do it, maybe, I, I don't quite have as much interest, uh, like with the Covid it's the same news all the time, and, uh, but uh, nonetheless I, I come here and I, I spend some time here. Um, yeah, it's a good bolt hole uh, for me.
So now, after that nice uh, break, um, walk, I'm back in my room and um, now I have to do some uh, ironing. Uh, so that's, and then I have to make my bed and then I have to prepare my homily for tomorrow. So uh, there's plenty to do. And then this evening, um, I'm going to have a special dinner for my 70th birthday. Uh, my actual birthday is tomorrow, but this evening w I'm having a birthday dinner with the community here and uh, my brother is coming, uh, one of my brothers is coming and his daughter. So tomorrow I'm going to my sister in Norwich and this, this brother can't come to that so it's rather nice it works out. So that's something to look forward to for this evening. So now the ironing. When, when I'm asked what, what do I love, I think I've already answered that. I really love uh, being a priest. I love uh, working with people. If I were asked what I fear, now, as a priest, I, I fear uh, being wrongly accused of, of something. I think I share that fear with a, a lot of priests. That we, we, we fear that someone one day will accuse us of doing something, some abuse that we haven't done. Um, but more, more poignantly, uh, more significantly, uh, I have a fear. I have a, 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 it is a fear that in a moment of weakness, of irresponsibility, that I will do something that will uh, let myself down, my family down, my order down, the church down. So. Um, there, there's always that possibility. No one can ever be 100% certain that you'll always do the right thing, always. So that would be a fear of mine, that, that I bring shame uh, on, on, on others and uh, my family, on myself. So that would be a fear. I, I also fear, in, still in the area of of religion is fundamentalism. 
of all kinds, uh, Jewish, Christian, or uh, Muslim fundamentalism. You know, th these people, these fundamentalists, Jewish, Christian, they will kill you in the name of God and think that they're doing right. And uh, that, to me, is very frightening. Um, I'll give a bit more thought to, to what I would like to change in the world and uh, in myself. Of all the questions, it's funny, it's the one that I find, uh, rightly or wrongly, it's the one I find hardest of the two, really, that, uh, to answer. I, th I think in myself, what I'd like to change, um, I'd like to have more um, courage, you know, the courage of my convictions. I, I kind of avoid areas of justice and peace, and I, I, I um, yeah, so I, that, that's something I think I would like to have more courage to do more uh, because there's some terrible things, uh, corrupt people, violence, injustice, um, that, you know, I, I would like to have the courage to say more, to be more prophetic. So that, that would be something. And, uh, and, uh, and what would I want to change in the world? Mm. Good. <laughs> Good question. I suppose there's a lot of things, but I, I'll just give it a bit more thought and then, then come up with an answer. <laughs> I like ironing. Uh, I can... It's one of those activities that you don't have to actually think much. And uh, so I like it for that reason. You, 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 it, it's a bit like washing, washing up. I actually like washing up. My brother-in-law can't understand that. He, he has a, a washing machine. And um, but I like to wash by hand. Uh, you know, he's a dishwasher in other words. I like to wash by hand. I like the conversation that you can have with someone else at the sink. Um, and with ironing as well. I like ironing for that reason. I mean, you don't usually iron with someone else, but I can resolve most of the world's problems uh, when I'm ironing. <laughs> it's, your mind goes off all over the place. Um, and uh, so that's one reason why I like ironing. I also like to see the effect it has when you've got a crinkly handkerchief and then you can make it all nice and neat and tidy and yeah I like that. I, I, I like uh, making things neat and tidy, clearing up mess. Yeah. So tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to be 70. What do I think about that? Oddly enough, maybe in some ways, I haven't given it much thought. It just is. I am 70 tomorrow. No, so be it. Um, it's, it. It's not going to make a difference uh, to me. But I suppose psychologically, it might do, you know, you think 70, mm, you know, that, that, that's quite old, isn't it? So maybe it might affect me that way. I may begin to think old, you know, to think I'm old. I hope not. I hope not. Um, I don't think I will, actually, for one reason or another. You know, I'm grateful that I love the world I'm living in. Happy with, you know, I'm not happy with everything. But, uh, you know, I, I have a brother, I play golf with him, I'm very fond of him. Of course, because he's my brother, and 
but he's, he gets angry. Uh, he shouts at the television, he shouts at, you know, if there's news. And sometimes when I'm with him, he, he will get angry uh, if we're discussing politics. You know, and he gets angry quite quickly and quite easily. And I was thinking about that and I realised, I think I know what his problem is. I think his problem is that the world is changing and he's not. And he feels he's being left behind. I could be wrong, of course. But that, that's what I, I, I suspect is the root of his anger, that he's sad, essentially, that the world is changing. And uh, I don't mind that. I, I don't mind the changing world. In fact, you know, if it doesn't change, there's something wrong. Because the world is made up of human beings and, and we're always changing. I, I don't find that a problem. But I think he does. You know, the church is changing. Again, because though it's an institution, it's made up of human beings. And human beings change. The church, when I was a, a child, is very different to the church today. The church, when I was a child, was uh, all Latin. I used to serve uh, the priest, and I would have to reply in Latin. Hadn't a clue what it meant, but anyway, you learned it off by rote. And uh, today, there is no Latin. There's a bit of Latin still, but it's all in English. And, and actually, some people don't like that. And again, I think it's this idea of, of change, and they don't like change. Uh, so the church, the church has changed. And I'm happy, actually. I'm happy with most of the change I see in the church. Uh, it is for me, for the most part, it's good. Yeah, it, it's good. I, 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 I see a lot of good things uh, in the church. I think the fact that Mass is in English is obviously a good thing. And there are other aspects too. Oh, well, for one thing, we never read the Bible when we were children. Not really, not... We, we, whereas today, we're encouraged much more you know, to read the Bible. I, I think there was an overreaction to Protestantism. And the Protestants' uh, church was very much based on the Word. And we Catholics reacted to that, but as often happens, we overreacted, and so we threw the baby out with the bathwater. And the, the, for a long time, the Catholic Church didn't really um, appreciate the significance of, of Scripture, um, at least on a, on, on a popular level. Whereas now, now uh, it, it's, it's very different. We, we really do. We've rediscovered the importance of the Word of God. Thank God. Yeah. So I'm still trying to think what I would like to, if I could change in the world. Yeah. You know, the world that we live in has become terribly secular, especially Western Europe, and, um, and materialistic, hedonistic as well, you know, so much, so much is about pleasure, the whole area of, of sexuality, pornography, you know, it's just so available. Um, 
we're, we're living in a world which, in some ways, in some ways, it, you know, it's quite pagan, really. So that's one thing, I suppose, that I would like to see change, is that people become more aware of something else in life beyond the, what you own and what you can have. I would love people to think more about the meaning of life. You know, what's life about? What are we here for? And actually, I think one of the good things that may well come out of this COVID-19 is for that to happen. I've already seen signs of that. Um, there was a woman wrote in the paper the other day, during COVID, she says, I was pining for the gym. And she says, now it's over. She said, I'm not bothered about my muscles and my shape, or, you know, at least to, to look so good anymore. There was, there was some other football fans. They, they interviewed three people, all fervent football fans. They were season ticket holders at Manchester United and Liverpool. And one said how important football was for him because of his family, because they met up as a family, and that's rather nice. But the other two uh, fans was, were somewhat disillusioned with, with football. And, uh, you know, because I think football has just got out of hand. It's, it's, I, I'm, I love sport. I'm passionate about sport. I love football. But there's too much of it. There's far too much football uh, in, uh, in, in England. You know, we, 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 there are other sports, for one thing. But there are other things in life that are more important. So, yeah, maybe if I could change something in the world, it would be that, that people become less materialistic and less secular. Um, you know, people are good uh, I, I, and generous. I have in my, my room, I meant to show it to you this morning, but I forgot. I have in my room a baton from the 2012 Olympics and everybody who volunteered for the Olympics <laughs> was given one. That's an awful lot of buttons. <laughs> so I was what they call an ambassador. That meant I had to go to Heathrow Airport and, and welcome people. To get that job I had to go through uh, three lots of sort of meetings and, and then they they sifted people. I thought I'd just get it. I was born, bred London, but no, you, you, you had to, you had to, that wasn't enough, you had to earn it. Anyway, the point I'm making is just how generous people were at the London Olympics. And you've, we've seen it now with COVID-19. Um, do you remember not that long ago the councils were asking for volunteers to help and there were so many volunteers uh, so quickly now that's that's what people are like people are generous and I would just like to tap into that more that generosity but expand it as well to say also think about uh, life as well. Think about what matters in life. Think about meaning. What, what, what does it mean to be who you are? And uh, where are you going? COVID has given people time to stop and to reflect. You know, most of the time, I think this is one of our big problems in our society today, is that we are... Uh, we, we, we are uh, too busy, we're in a rush, we're in, on that treadmill and um, Covid has, has stopped that treadmill and we've come off uh, 
And over these months now, it has had an effect on people. And actually, I'm hoping and praying that some of these people, especially the youngsters, anybody between 18 and, and 35, will now be thinking about God again. You know, what about God, uh, the spiritual, rather than just the material? So there's my long-winded <laughs> answer to the question, what I would like to change in the world. Yeah, I would like the world, I would like people to become less materialistic. Uh, and uh, let's just simply say, maybe uh, more, more thoughtful, more spiritual, more spiritual, more reflective uh, about what really matters in life, which isn't what you own, it's who you are as a person. Yeah. That'll do. Now. Now, got these underpants? Jam on top. I'm not sure, in fact, I, I'm not going to film tonight with my brother coming to dinner. Um, yeah, I think I've done enough in a way. <laughs> I've done enough filming. And I can relax more. And my, his daughter, she, she will throw a wobbly if she knows that she's been filmed. <laughs> she's, she is extremely self-conscious so I don't want to put her through that and yeah so I think that will be that will be enough filming uh, for the time being I'll do uh, I'll do some more now um, when I finish the ironing because I, I, I want to write my homily and I want to share with you something about uh, maybe how I'm thinking when I write my homily so now I um, have to prepare my homily for tomorrow. Tomorrow morning I'm saying the 8, uh, or celebrating the 8.30 Mass tomorrow morning. I'm going off to my sister afterwards to Norwich for, for my actual birthday uh, celebrations. So uh, what I do to prepare my homily is first of all I read the, the reading. So we have... Uh, three readings but I concentrate on two and uh, the first reading is uh, is interesting um, it's about Solomon and the wisdom of Solomon uh, let's see uh, it's like a genie says ask what you want and I will give it to you the God says to Solomon and this is what Solomon replies um, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in succession to David my father. But I am very young man, unskilled in leadership. Your servant finds himself in the midst of this people of yours that you have chosen. And people so many, its numbers cannot be counted or reckoned. And so this is what he asked for. A heart to understand how to discern between good and evil... For who could govern this people of yours that is so great? So that's interesting and that pleased God because this is what God says to him. Since you have asked for this and not for and not asked for long life for yourself or riches or... or you, so in other words, that was more or less what I was saying earlier when I was ironing, you know, how riches, what you have isn't important. Uh, but you've asked for a discerning judgment for yourself uh, and God gives him what he asked for and he adds I give you a heart wise and shrewd 
as none before you have had and none will have after you. Hence that expression, the wisdom of Solomon. Now in the Gospel from St Matthew, this is what we read. Jesus said to his disciples, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone has found. He hides it again, goes off happy, tell, sells everything he owns and buys the field. So that's, that's one image of the kingdom of heaven, someone who finds a hidden treasure. And the second uh, concept is, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he finds one of great value, he goes and sells everything he owns and he buys it. So you can see the link there with, with wisdom, that, that it's more precious than anything else. So, so that's my task now. I haven't got long. Uh, in fact, I'm in a, a, under pressure now to, to get this homily written uh, before my brother and niece come uh, at seven. And I should say, I should get ready before then. Uh, say some prayers and maybe have a quick wash. I, 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 I will... I won't wear my clericals f for, for them. So, uh, so here we go. So uh, coming to the end of the day, it's uh, 11 o'clock now at night and um, it was nice to see my brother and my niece here and uh, saw me blowing out their candles on the cake. So covered something of, of that uh, celebration, but the big day is, is tomorrow for me. It's my 70th birthday and I'll be going to Norwich to celebrate it with my uh, sister and uh, and uh, family uh, there. So now I think there is just uh, one question which I haven't answered and that is what's in my pocket? So <laughs> which I thought was an intriguing question and, and actually I like that question. There was something about um, it being personal and uh, I thought that's clever because it's, uh, you know, what do you love 
what do you fear, what do you like to change? But then that fourth question, what's in your pockets? This, this marvellous uh, question. Uh, so let's have a look and see what I have in my pockets. <laughs> All right, well, uh, one mobile phone in, in my pocket, uh, one handkerchief, one uh, mask <laughs> for COVID-19, uh, rosary beads, which uh, a good Catholic will not always carry around with them, but many, many Catholics do. There's my rosary beads. Uh, what else? I haven't got much. I don't carry much in my pocket. And then I have my wallet in my back pocket. My wallet. Let's see how much money I've got in there. Uh, 20, 40, uh, 60, 80, 100. I've got £110. I'm doing very well. And uh, then I got my cards, my Visa card that's for the vocations account. Got my uh, uh, it's a travel money card with the post office. Haven't got anything on that. That's my Banster Downs Golf Club card. My Freedom Pass. That that's that's pure gold. That is really is yeah. And uh, then. I got my uh, driving license. This is something if you belong to the order, it's like an accreditation to the order. Uh, and then there's my senior rail card. Again, that's invaluable. A third off. So that's it, really. That's that's my what's in my pockets. Nothing very exciting. That's it. Finito. So that's it. That's the end of my uh, day in the life of. I began rather nervously, but as the day went on, so I got more into it and uh, in the end, uh, I actually came to enjoy it. So I'm grateful to uh, the people who encouraged us to do this a day in the life of. Uh, I think it's a good idea. I think everybody, everybody has a wonderful story uh, to tell. So thank you. Uh, and uh, that's it. I'll now say good night. And God bless.